wanted to introduce myself and a little bit about what I do. Um, I've got a little bit of imposter syndrome here today. Um, sometimes imposter syndrome is, isn't justified. Today it is because I'm actually an imposter. Uh, I don't do UX. I'll tell you what I do do. I help people set up systems and design systems where people can get stuff they want done. Um, I help people to make those systems forgiving. I help people to make those systems transparent. I help people to um, get warnings when they're about to do something irrevocable with their systems. I use a lot of the same kind of heuristics that you UX people are probably familiar with. The difference is that my systems that I work with are human beings. I'm a lean and agile consultant, so I help people set up processes where they can get something done with a group of people. Um, people are not predictable, not predictable at all. Back in the day when I was uh, first starting, I'm nearly 20 years in industry now, so I graduated in 1998, um, and I started on this project. This project had been going for one year when I started, and um, that, was, that was just the development that had been going for a year. It had a full year of analysis before that and half a year worth of design after that. So two and a half years in, I joined this project. And I was for three years working in a basement because um, it was a defense project. They did let me out of the basement at night, you know. Um, but three years I was in that basement working on this project. And I left the project. And a year after that, it made it to court. Um, and they litigated because the cost of change had become so high, so huge, and the software that was being produced just wasn't valuable anymore, and people didn't want to pay for it, and obviously the company I was working for did want to get paid. And there were a lot of real arguments over this. And the thing that Waterfall does is it assumes that you can actually predict what you're going to get out of what you're planning. Uh, Dave Snowden, one of my favorite people in the world, he um, wrote... A Harvard Business Review article called A Leader's Framework for Decision Making. And he covered that here. And it's, this is the core of what I want to talk to you about today. It's this framework that he introduced. And it's called Kinevin. So I know some of you have already had the misfortune of hearing me talk about this because I, it's really hard to stop me talking about this. Um, hands up if you've heard of Kinevin before. A few people. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this innovation cycle. It's, the important thing about Kinevin is it's got these dynamics in it. And we're very, very familiar with the dynamics. So this is going to help you to put it into context. Um, Kyocera, when they first created camera phones, um, they were one of the early adopters of the camera phone. It was a differentiator for them. So what they did, they put the camera um, on the front of the phone, and it was landscape mode. And if you go to Wikipedia, you can see one of these. And they pointed it towards the user, and they thought that the users would use it for making video calls. And it turned out that was a little bit expensive, and that wasn't really what people wanted it for. Um, and of course, Nokia came along, and they spoiled the differentiator. They put the camera on the back of the phone. Anybody remember what was on the back of the phone next to the camera? A mirror, right? They put a little tiny mirror so that you could take selfies. Yeah, so Nokia invented the selfie. Thanks for that, Nokia. Um, of course, nowadays, put your hands up if you've got a camera on your phone. Keep your hands up if you've got two, one on the front and one on the back. So the camera has become commoditized. It's now a really well understood problem. And it's so well understood that we can actually develop more innovation and build on top of it. And now we've got things like Pokemon Go. And this is the innovation cycle. I wanted to show this to you just so you can probably think of all kinds of technology, all kinds of things you've seen where this pattern has emerged. This, we've got a problem, we don't really understand it. And then we come to understand this, and then it's very stable, and it gets built on. And this is how technology emerges. And a lot of what I'm saying, you'll be able to look back at the talk that James said. He's explained it in different words. It's the same, same concept. All right. The hardest thing about Kinevin is pronouncing it. If I show you how it's spelt, now how many people have heard of it? A few more, OK. Um, it's, it's pronounced, it's Welsh word, so it's pronounced like Kevin with an N in it. So say the word Kevin to me, say Kevin. Kevin. Say, uh, put an N in it, say Kevin. 
There you go, you got it. That's the hardest thing about it. It's got five domains, and the domain, their domains are not quadrants. Um, the boundaries of them are fuzzy, as you've already seen. Things move around. But they describe different situations and how to approach those situations depending on how predictable or unpredictable they are. So the first situation we look at is obvious. And an obvious problem is either one which child can solve or if it does require expertise, the solution's still obvious. So I can go to my landlady in the pub and I go, so what do you do when the beer runs out? And she, she says, well, I change the barrel, obviously, duh. Right? I, I think of them as duh problems. Dayton only uses word categorize rather than duh, but it's a duh problem. So we can say it's a one of those problems. We've seen this before. We know exactly how to solve it. I don't know how to change a barrel, but it's still obvious to me that that is the solution. When things become more and more complicated, they require more expertise. So a watchmaker knows how to fix a watch. A car mechanic knows how to fix a car. A lot of mechanical things end up in this space. It's still predictable. It's got a known outcome. So what you can do, if you have the expertise, is you can look at the outcome that you're trying to achieve, look at where you are, and close the gap. You can analyze the problem. And analysis works really well in this space. The problem comes from this domain down here, chaos. Chaos is accident and emergency. It is your house burning down. It is a transient domain, it resolves itself quickly, and it might not resolve itself in your favor. It's also regarded as the domain of urgent opportunity, but it's normally a bad place to be. It's normally regarded as a really bad place to be. And um, We, as human beings, we do not like uncertainty. We tend to associate uncertainty with bad things happening. In chaos, you have to act, and act quickly. Just to give you an example of what chaos can look like in software development, there was once a company called Knight Capital Group. End of 2012, they released something onto eight of their nine servers. You forgot the ninth one. And a flag they were using turned on some software, which was replaced on the eighth server, but not on the ninth. So it's old software on the ninth. And on the, ninth, so on the Monday morning, they went to the market, and this ninth server started putting spurious trades into the marketplace. And a lot of people noticed and started taking advantage of those trades. And by the time they turned it off 45 minutes later, that company had lost $440 million, and it prompted their fire sale. So that company no longer exists. It's quite a large group. And that is why we don't like complexity. It's why we have this innate desire to get out of this complex space. Complexity... So in the obvious domain, cause and effect are easily correlated. In complicated domain, cause and effect can be correlated with expertise. In the chaotic domain, they can't be correlated at all. In complexity, you can correlate it with hindsight in retrospect. You can see how you got there, but you couldn't possibly have predicted it. So my favorite example of this is a company called Ludicor. They had this big on game called Game Never Ending, big online game. And they wanted to get more people to play the game. So as part of this game, they, they had this mechanism for sharing screenshots of the game. And they set up these tools for people to share screenshots. And they shared screenshots. Um, and it was kind of working. And what actually happened, I only found this out recently, uh, they ran out of money because the dot-com crash happened and the funding got pulled. And so they're left with this half-finished game and these tools. People aren't just using them for sharing screenshots. They're using them for holiday photos, landscapes, kittens, all those exciting photos you find on the internet. And that became Flickr. That's how Flickr came into being. And you can see in retrospect how it's happened. But you couldn't possibly have predicted it from an online game. Stuart Butterfield, who founded Flickr, tried to resurrect this game again fairly recently. And apparently he's got a loyal following who are still trying to make it work. Um, but again found that it, it wasn't profitable, it wasn't a, the right thing to be doing. By then, they got the messaging behind the scenes of this game working for the admins. Right? So the admin messaging behind the scenes is working. That became Slack. And you can see in retrospect how it's happened, but you couldn't have predicted it. It wasn't intentional. In complexity, we get unexpected side effect, emergent consequences. And James said, you know, we were going to hear that word. Complexity is the domain of emergence. It's the domain of innovation. 
We don't know what's going to happen in that domain. We can see it in retrospect. So we have to do what's called probe, which means to try something out that's safe to fail. In the middle, we have disorder, the fifth domain. Disorder is the domain where we don't know which of these dominates, so we behave according to our preferred domain. So I want you to put your hands up if you've ever been asked for an estimate in time or money for something you've never ever done before. Keep your hands up if you were a fool and you gave one. And keep your hands up if that then got treated as a promise or a commitment. Right? Everybody's hands are up. Um, that is disorder. That is treating something complex where you can't possibly predict what's going to happen as if it's complicated. And the whole of Waterfall is predicated on the idea that we can do that. We can take these new things that we've never done before and predict what's going to happen. I have this little scale which I use to help people work out where they are on that, on that diagram. Um, and I ask, who in the world has ever done this before? So fine, nobody in the world's ever done it before. Might not work at all, right? It, it might totally fail. Um, for somebody in, has done it before, but it's outside of our organization. We have no access to expertise. We're probably spoiling somebody else's differentiator. Um, we don't know how it's going to land in our organization. We don't know how long it took them, who got fired for taking too long, what stumbling blocks they came across. So it's still a high discovery space. Three, someone in the company has done it before, or we've got access to expertise. We can learn it from a book, learn it from YouTube, go on a training course easily. Two, someone in the team has done it before, and one, we all know how to do it. I showed this to somebody on a government project, um, and he was doing a target operating model. He looked at this and he said, okay, so the, the fives and fours, that's where the value is. That's why we're doing what we're doing, because we want something new that we don't already have. I said, yeah, it's really brilliant. He said, um, but that's also where the risk is. That's where we're going to make the most discoveries. That's where things might go wrong. It's more, more likely to go wrong. He said, yeah, absolutely. This is the domain of unknown unknowns. You don't know what you don't know, but now you know where it is that you don't know things. He said, right. So we should do those first. I said, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I teach people. Do it first. And he said, but the entire industry does it the other way around. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, they do that. Um, we tend to analyze things and hope that this stuff will drop out at the end. And he had his target operating model on the wall behind him. And what he had done, he had all of the stuff that they'd been able to analyze with these big gaps saying TBD, where they were still trying to thrash out the new stuff. And he realized that he'd been bringing people in to get feedback from people on, on his new target operating model. And they'd all looked at this and gone, yep, looks good. And he wasn't learning anything. He wasn't making those discoveries. To make the discoveries, he would have had to really try and address those TBD things, give it a stab, maybe make a few different proposals and get feedback on them. In complexity, we learn by doing. So what does a probe look like? Well, a probe has to be safe to fail for starters, but it's, you've got to have a way of knowing it's succeeding and a way of knowing it's failing. Otherwise, you can't tell whether it's working or not. If it's failing, you want a way of dampening it, stopping it from having the impact it is. If you release something to production and it causes your conversion to tank or causes your users to drop, um, you want to be able to pull it back. You've got to have a way of amplifying it. If you're doing a prototype or a spike, the chances are good that it's not really technically sound. It's got some tech debt in it. You've got to be able to tidy it up. You've got to be able to spill it out to more people. You've got to be able to anchor it in place. And then it has this thing called coherence. And coherence is interesting. Coherence is a realistic reason for thinking that the probe might have a positive impact. I'm a bdd -er, which means I like using examples in conversation to illustrate how things are going to behave. And I like asking, well, can you give me an example of that? There's a really interesting thing happening in UX at the moment. A lot of people are very interested in hypothesis-driven development. And lean UX with this hypothesis. We're going to have this hypothesis and see whether it works or not. Your hypothesis is just one of many things that could happen. And some of them will fail, and some of them will counter success. And you don't know which those are going to be until you try it. 
That's what I really wanted to talk about in this session, that difference between coherence and hypothesis. Hypotheses are great in science. You can prove things or disprove things, and it's repeatable. When you're dealing with human systems and interaction with human systems, you don't know what's going to happen. In high uncertainty, these scenarios and examples that you come up with, they're not tests. You haven't necessarily failed if your hypothesis doesn't work out. You might also fail for other reasons. So a, a safe to fail probe, you, you might look at it and go, OK, we're seeing what we expected, but it's still not good, right? And there is no way of avoiding failure completely. But we focus on it a lot of the time. A lot of the time we spend our time trying to research things, our time trying to get hold of that analysis so that we can make predictions. And then we focus on those predictions. And it's because of this little elephant in our heads that says, that won't work. That won't work because, that won't work because. Even if we're used to doing it at work, we're used to reaching out for uncertainty at work, we tend to do this with our lives. So I want to give a very quick example of how Kenevin has totally changed my life and the way I, I, I think nowadays. Um, I still do this because I'm a human being. Um, my boyfriend asked me a couple of years ago if I would move in with him. And I have a sad elephant in my head. Um, and the sad elephant says, you know, that won't work because. I'm an introvert. I have an extrovert job. I speak a lot at conferences. I work with people all the time. And I'm often quite tired and I often want my own space. And I'm a hard person to live with as a result. So I said, that's not going to work. It's not, it, that's not going to go well. I, I'm, you're going to get on my nerves, and then I'm going to be sad, and that will get on your nerves, and it will spoil our relationship, which is really good. So I don't want to do that. And because my boyfriend, bless him, knows about Kenevin, and he knows about safe to fail probes, he said, well, why don't we try it for a year as an experiment? A year and a half later, the landlord wanted the house back. And so we had to move, and we had to explain to the movers why we still had two of absolutely everything. OK. We don't like uncertainty. We, we tend to try and avoid having uncertainty. Um, it's extremely stressful to have uncertainty. University College London did this experiment where they had a game with snakes under rocks. And you had to turn the rocks over. And if there was a snake underneath, you got an electric shock, right? I don't know who volunteers for these experiments. They're braver than me. Um, but what they found was that the, the incentive was to try and work out how the population of snakes behave. And they varied the probability of finding a snake or not finding a snake. The most stress people suffered was when there was a 50% chance of finding a snake. Not when they were certain to find a snake and get an electric shock. Not when they were certain that they were going to be fine and occasionally get a shock, but when there was, they didn't know either way. That balance in the middle. Those people who are at that 50% mark also were best at making the predictions about the snake's behavior. So it's stressful, and it makes us really creative at the same time. So I want to do a little experiment with you. And this is from Daniel Kahneman's uh, Judgment Under Uncertainty paper. I think he mentions it in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, as well. Judgment Under Uncertainty is a really great paper on how bad we are as human beings in actually making the, these um, predictions. So imagine you've got two hospitals, a large one and a small one. The large one's got 45 babies born every day. The small one has 15. And what the hospitals do, every time there are more than 60% boys, they mark that day. They make that day red in the calendar, right? Who do you reckon has more red days? The large hospital, the small hospital, or do you reckon they're both about the same within about 5% of each other? So who reckons the large hospital has more days circled in red? Who reckons it's a small hospital? Who reckons they're both about the same? OK, so we've got more hands up for C than we have B. The answer is actually B. OK, B, by quite a long way, will have way more days where there's more than 60% boys. 
And I'm pleased to see that a lot of you can actually do probability maths at the very least, you know, and, and work out that if you've only got 15, the chance of getting 60% or, or more. A lot of people say A. It's about 22% of people say A, and about 22% of people say, um, say C, and about 50% say B. Okay. Um, so here's, here's another example of how awful we are at even seeing things in retrospect. You know, um, we, we have a tendency, this thing called apophenia, our tendency to see patterns that don't exist and to then fixate on those patterns. I went to this little company, um, and the way I came into this company, I had two people turn up for Extreme Tuesday Club, uh, which is a, a, just a pub meet we have in London, and they kind of shuffled into the room like this. And I said, you know, I'm friendly, so I'm like, come in, come in. They're like, are, are you here for XTC? They said, uh, yeah, we're not sure we're agile enough. I said, okay, well, you know, everybody's on a journey. So uh, tell me, how often do you ship? They said, a few times a day. Uh, hold on, hold on, a few times a day to production. Yeah. I said, I, I needed to go see how this company became that agile without realizing that that was an extremely agile thing. This was a few years back, so it was even before the DevOps movement. Um, and it turned out they had this really experimental culture. And this was one of the graphs they had on the wall. And I looked at it, and it had kind of numbers in the hundreds up one axis and dates, time along the bottom. And I said, oh, is that your bug count? They said, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I said, that's really interesting. What happened? They said, well, it was getting a bit high, so we thought we should do something about it. What we did was we hired a developer uh, a new dev, and then we ex rotated an existing team member through the bug fixing role. I went, oh, okay. And the bug started to go down. Yeah. And it was working so well, we thought we'd do it again. So we hired another new dev, and then rotated another existing team member through the bug fixing role. Now, what I do, because I'm a human being, is I automatically start spotting patterns. And I think I understand. You know, if those of us who voted 15, I was one of them, on that previous puzzle, on Nob's puzzle tree. Right? We saw the pattern and thought, ah, got it. And then we fix on it. And we don't change the pattern once we fix on it. And me, I saw this graph and I, I thought to myself, well, you know, I said it out aloud, was the new dev no good then? This poor guy, I've not even met him and I've got all this judgment just because of a picture I've seen on the wall. And they said, oh, no, it wasn't new dev. He was fine. I said, oh, okay. Did the team get complacent? So now I'm judging the whole team based on this graph. You know, it's what we do. We're human beings. We're quite judgmental. Um, and they said, no, no, it wasn't a team. I said, okay, well, was the code base too complex? Was there too much tech debt? And I kept guessing and guessing. Meanwhile, the, these gentlemen are standing there with these really big grins on their faces, just watching me try and guess. They're like, oh, you won't guess. I said, okay, well, who was, how were these bugs getting into the system? And they said, well, they weren't. They were already there. I said, Okay, so who was reporting them? They said, ah, it was the users. The users had spotted we were fixing the bugs, and so they'd started reporting them. It was a good thing. The bug count going up was a good thing. A side effect, completely the opposite of the hypothesis. In complexity, things sometimes work, and not for the reasons you think. A few examples for you. Kleenex, originally marketed for removing cold cream. They found that some people were using them as pocket handkerchiefs, and they did some research. I think this is back in the 1960s. Did some research into how many people are actually using these as pocket handkerchiefs. It turned out it was 60% of their sales was people using them not for removing makeup, but as pocket handkerchiefs. And so they changed their marketing and started marketing as them as pocket handkerchiefs, and their sales doubled. Space Invaders. How many of us are old enough to remember Space Invaders? Right? They were trying to make these Space Invaders move across the screen. And unfortunately, when you've got this many Space Invaders on these really creaky old computers, it was using a lot of processing power. And so these Space Invaders were moving quite slowly. And they found that as you killed the Space Invaders and, and removed more and more of them, so the processor was able to catch up with it. And they move faster and faster. It turned out people loved that. <laughs> they invented the difficulty curve as a side effect of trying to, trying to get this, these space invaders to move. And it turned out people loved it, so they kept it. Sony. 
had, uh, as part of their Walkman, they, they used to have this lovely black Walkman, and they made a lovely yellow one, a nice sporty yellow one. And they asked people, they did their UX research, they went out there and they asked people, which do you prefer, the black one or the yellow one? Nice black one, nice sporty yellow one. And they went, oh, the yellow one, the yellow one. And then somebody had the really bright idea of inviting all these people, they'd come to do the research. They left the Walkmans on tables at the back of the room. And they said, just take one, then you can have one for free as you, as you leave. And everybody took the black one. They didn't want to tell the salesman that his lovely yellow sporty new Walkman wasn't cool. So somehow the researchers were biasing their own research with their expectations. And that actually happens quite a lot. You learn by doing. Um, AA had this thing called a car genie. It was originally intended just to track where your car was so they could come recover it when it broke down. Obviously, the side effect of this is you can now track cars all over the place, including when they're stolen. Um, you can check to see how people are doing on their journey and predict when they're going to arrive. There's all kinds of uses for car tracking. And then, of course, there's the most famous side effect of all, this little blue pill. We all know what the side effect of Viagra is. The really interesting thing is how they found out. Normally, after a clinical research trial, they go back and get all the unused pills from people. They were having trouble getting people to give back their pills. <laughs> it was working, but not for the reasons you think. Those are success stories. Sometimes we see the failure stories. Walmart did a big piece of research, and all of their customers said, we want the aisles to be less cluttered. And so they went through this massive change. It was not a probe. It was not safe to fail. They went and did it, and all their stores decluttered the aisle. Welcome to the new Walmart. And all the customer satisfactions ratings went through the roof, and their sales plummeted by 1.8 billion. And then they had to undo it, because people say one thing and then do another. You learn by getting people to do things. Here's an example from software development. We had a user interface we were designing. Back in the day, I was working with a, a white goods retailer, electronics retailer. Um, I was with ThoughtWorks at the time. They were our clients. And as part of the sales software we were producing, we had this thing where you could scan a barcode, and it would bring up those sales from your receipt. And then you could just click the item that you wanted to refund it, and it would be an, an easy to refund. But because we needed to support legacy receipts as well, we also had a mechanism where you could just type in the receipt number and type in the details and manually process a refund. We accidentally made the legacy system way easier to use than the, the one where you scan the barcode. So, of course, all the salespeople are in the shops are just bypassing all our careful UX on UI design and just going straight for this manual process which causes havoc when you're trying to do stock control and work out how much commission people get and things like that. So it was successful, but not in the way we were intending. There's a paper about this called From Safety 1 to Safety 2, really great read. Safety 1 is where something goes wrong and you work out how to prevent it from going wrong again. Safety 2 says it's going right and not for the reasons you think. Go find out why it's going right. Go find out what human interventions are helping it go right. Go find out how people are actually using this thing that you've produced. Because the chances are that you will then need to anchor that thing in place. You will need to make sure that carries on happening. And unless you pay attention to why things are going right, you won't do that. I have this real visual image when I think about Kenevin. Um, not just the words, but I, I see kind of colors and stuff. And I wanted to share that with you um, because it's what lets me, when I see those same colors, those same things in other contexts, really make that connection. I tend to think of the, the obvious domain as being kind of children's toys. And the complicated domain is all made of metal and everything's a bit greasy. In the Celtic domain, everything's obviously on fire. The complex domain, I always think of kind of plasticine growths and stuff like that. But I, I like elephants, so you've got elephants in this one. Um, 
In the complicated domain, things are the sum of their parts. You can take things apart, you can analyze things, you can research things and then put it back together and that will work. In the complex domain, it's about relationships. It's dominated by relationships. And really interesting things start happening when we start relating to our users and inviting our users to collaborate and looking at the relationships between users and their environments. So this lady is uh, Dr. Lucy King. She has a company called, um, a charity called Elephants and Bees. And what they do is they try and stop elephants from trampling on crops. And they try and set up fences. Now, if you put up a fence against an elephant, you try and put a wall to stop an elephant coming through. Elephants don't like that much. They, they have their old migration routes and they just go straight through those walls. Right? They just go straight through the fences. They trample them down and then they eat all the crops. And one elephant can destroy an entire year's worth of crops in a few hours. And then, of course, the people try and shoot the elephants, and the elephants don't like that very much, and it's not good for either side. So it's much better if we can stop the elephants from trampling on the crops. Elephants, turn out, are scared of bees. They're scared of bees. So what this lady has done, she's been teaching people how to make fairly cheap beehives. And you put these beehives so they swing. And you make a fence out of these beehives. And when the elephant touches the fence, the bees all come out of the hives and start buzzing. And the elephant's like, ah, and they, then they go somewhere else. And it's a really great way of protecting the crops. And as a side effect, you get honey out of it. Elephant-friendly honey, they call it. It turns out that actually you don't need every single beehive to be a real beehive. You can put fake beehives every other beehive, and it still works just fine. They've got to swing like the real beehives. That's the only thing. Okay? They had to swing like the real beehives, and then you can have the fake ones too. Um, because elephants also spot patterns that don't exist. This is the first ever use of a hashtag. When you invite people to collaborate, when you give them room for creativity, your users will do unexpected things with your products. Here's one of my favorites, my absolute favorites. People who know me know I'm a massive Skyrim fan. This is Nexus Mods. Nexus Mods is a site where they have mods that you can apply to games. You can see Skyrim down there. 1.3 billion Skyrim mod downloads. I'm reasonably sure about 10,000 of those are mine. And this one is one of my favorites. On April Fool's Day, Reddit produced this thing called Reddit Place, and they like doing these social experiments with people every year. Reddit Place was a canvas, a thousand by thousand pixel grid, and you could choose a color and click, and it would make a pixel there, and you could only do it once every 10 minutes, which meant that you couldn't do anything fun with that on your own. You had to collaborate with other people. And of course, on the subreddits, people were trying to get their icons for their subreddits, trying to get the flags for their countries up on this canvas. And people are, are fighting over space on it. Um, after some uh, petition, they reduced the time to once every five minutes. And you get these really interesting things happening, right? You've, you've got IKEA and our factory. So I, an IKEA subreddit. Who knew there was an IKEA subreddit? Um, there's a couple of, there's some gaming subreddits up there. They all had to make these treaties about their borders just because of their geographical proximity. They literally reinvented the whole of human politics on this, on this canvas. Emergent behavior, right? Proper emergent behavior as a result of just giving them a place to play. I actually had to zoom in on this because of um, our Australia's contribution, which was not safe for work. Thank you, Australia. Um, there's a thing that happens when we do this. We, we make these discoveries when we actually get out there into the real world. And the chances are that despite our research, despite what we tried to analyze, despite what we tried to do, we're probably going to get some stuff wrong, and we're going to make discoveries. 
The complex domain does not have predictability. Somebody once asked me, well, what is the difference between complex and complicated? And I said, well, how about a football game? And I said, I don't know. I said, well, does it have a known outcome or not? And they said, well, it depends. Is our England playing? <laughs> I said, just because it's disposed that England will lose does not make it completely predictable. So the complex domain has disposition. Some things are better ideas than others. But we will probably find side effects. We'll find ways it worked that we didn't expect. We'll find ways that it fails that we couldn't possibly predict. Sometimes failure will be a success. I have one team. Um, they released a search functionality on their app. Uh, and their hypothesis was, you know, 1% one, 1 of people will use this, and that will be good enough to keep it. And actually, only 0.7% of people used the search functionality. So it wasn't really worth keeping. But what they did find was that every single person who was using that search functionality was searching for the same feature. So they were then able to put that feature on the front of their app. And it really helped their users. It helped improve their user ratings. Um, so again, hy the hypothesis failed. But they learned from it stuff that they would never have learned before. And if they had said, you know, we should produce a search bar so that we can see what kind of things people are searching for, that would have been an awesome idea. And they'd have probably regarded it as a perfect success. It wasn't what they were thinking of when they produced it. You'd get these side effects. As a result of the side effects, we need to change direction. And we need to change direction quickly. We need to be able to undo the things we just did that were a bad idea reinforce and change the things that we just did that turn out to be a good idea. UX, good UX, and UI design and DevOps go hand in hand together. I don't actually believe that in this day and age you can have good user interaction without also being able to ship really quickly and tear down the things you've shipped and actually try things out with small groups of users. I think that every organization that's working in an innovative space, which is a lot of them, it's not all of them, but it's a lot of them, those organizations are going to be overtaken by their competitors if they do not learn how to ship. If you are working in UX and you see DevOps practices starting to happen, please help them amplify them. Look to see where those probes are already working in your organization, those experiments. We're trying to get things shipped. Amplify them, go, that's awesome. That's what we need. As UX people, that's what we need. We need DevOps. Because it's only by learning that you actually, it's only by doing that you actually learn. Thank you very much. <laughs>